Okay, so this is the mock paper, okay, which happens to be May 2013. Please excuse the firecrackers outside, it is fire, yes, and the fact that I've got a cold and I'm sniffing a lot. <laughs> I'm going to start with question number one. Okay, which is a nice, simple start. We have a mass of elephant 10 to the power of 4. Okay, and we're dividing it by the mass of a mouse, which is 10 to the minus 2. And we're subtracting indices because we're dividing. So it's 4 minus minus 2, okay, which becomes a plus. So it's 4 plus 2, which equals 6 which gives us an answer of 10 to the power of 6. Okay, question number 2, which is about accuracy and precision. We have um, arrows striking a target really close together. So what we obviously have is a precise situation, but the um, target is here. So we've got a very inaccurate situation. So the answer will be C because it's precise, they're all together, but not accurate. We have the graph showing how velocity v varies with time t. And the graph is a velocity time graph. Now, from basic definitions, the area of a velocity time graph is displacement, which is A. Question 4. Two identical balls are dropped from a tall building, one a few seconds after the other. Okay? And we've got air resistance not being negligible. Now, because air resistance is not negligible, we will eventually end up with terminal speed. Okay? So that means that the balls will um, initially accelerate, but as air resistance builds up, um, we will eventually get to a point where you will end up with a constant velocity. Now what happens is the first ball will hit that point first. The second one, so initially this one will be going faster, it will be accelerating. The first ball will be going faster than the second one. So there will be an initial build up increase. But as soon as they're both constant, they'll then fall with the same displacement between them. Okay, um, so the answer is increase, but then remains constant. Question five, which of the following is always true for an object moving in a straight line? Well, if you remember Newton's first law, okay, um, the answer is B. Because when an, like when an object is going at a constant speed, it's because there are no resultant force. If it was A, there's always the option, no forces. If no forces are acting, it's possible that the object could be standing still. Zero meters per second squared. Okay, so... Sorry, meters per second. So when something is standing still... or moving at constant speed. So the only possible answer is B. Right, question six, this is a tricky one. And this is Newton's third law we're looking at, action and reaction. Initially you have a person of weight 600 Newtons standing on a weighing scale in an elevator. The elevator is accelerating upwards And the question is, which of the following is the reading on the scale? So, the reading on the scale is going to be equal and opposite to the force that's pulling the lady up. Okay, so if we can find this total force upwards, then we will just as easily find the force that's acting down. So, what is this force that's pulling the lady upwards? Well, initially... The force has to lift the weight. 
So it's going to be 600 newtons, but it's accelerating. So there's going to be an extra force due to the mass being accelerated. Now, what is the mass being accelerated? Well, if weight is 600 newtons, then mass must be 60. Why? Because 60 times 10 equals the weight, 600. So therefore, if we substitute that in there, and we substitute 1 in for acceleration, we have a resultant force up equal to 600 plus 60, which is equal to 660 newtons. So therefore, the force down is going to be equal, 660 down, which is D. And now, question number seven. Um, oops. Let's try that again. Question number seven. We have a spaceship moving at a constant speed in outer space. So it's moving at a constant speed, and then there's an internal explosion. Now, the thing about explosions is they tend to be caused by something which has some form of reserve energy. So what we have before is we have kinetic energy. It's moving at a constant velocity. But then the explosion could be caused by a reserve of chemical energy perhaps, or a collision with something else. In this case, we don't have that information. But explosions have to happen because of something, an extra addition of energy from somewhere. So let's have a look at the question. It's asking you, how does, which of the following best describe what happens to the total momentum and total kinetic energy? Well, momentum is always the same. Okay, so... Whatever it was that caused the explosion was in there before and was moving at that constant velocity. So the momentum is always the same. But the total kinetic energy, because of the cause, which is unstated, has to have been increased. The total kinetic energy. Not the total energy, but the total kinetic energy. Because whatever it was that caused the explosion was some other form of energy that now has become kinetic. So the answer is B. Okay, These explosion questions are quite common. Um, let's have a look. Okay, so we have a disc rotating and points oops, P and Q at distances R and 2R from the centre. And the acceleration is A. And what happens when you go from R, P, sorry, to Q, which has um, twice the radius? So if you look on the data booklet, we have two formulas. A equals V squared over R, which isn't very useful because we don't have V. But we're also given A equals 4 pi squared, which could be derived from up here, but it doesn't matter, it's on the data booklet, r over t squared. Okay, so now let's look at our situation. Change colour here. The period for both p and q is the same, because they're spinning on the same disc. So t squared stays the same. But radius is doubled, so we have 2r, which if we leave that expression, we'll multiply a, we'll find that acceleration goes up by 2. Okay, so the answer is C. Let's see what else we've got. Question number 9. Okay, so we have method of mixtures. We have 40 kilograms of water, Okay, mixed with one kilogram of water at zero. So what we need is, we need to find out how much energy is in this at 100 degrees, plus how much energy is here at zero degrees, and then we, we apply that Q, um, that total Q, to the new situation, 
which is when we have five kilograms, okay? So basically the amount of energy that five kilograms of this water has at this temperature X is going to be equal to the amount of energy that the four kilos have plus the amount of energy that the one has. So if we express that with like the Q of five would be equal to the Q of four plus the Q of one. Okay, so we have five using M C delta T. And remember we have to use um Kelvin. So we have um I'm gonna do this in Kelvin first. Five kilos times C times T, okay, which I don't know yet, will be equal to four C two hundred and seventy three plus a hundred plus one C two hundred and seventy three which is what's happening here. Um, okay, so we can get rid of that C, get rid of the C specific heat capacity. And what we end up with is 5D equals 4 times 373 plus 273. Okay. T equals um, 1,000... 765 divided by 5, which if I work it out on my calculator, gives us 353 Kelvin, okay? And if we subtract 273 from it, we end up with 80 degrees, okay? Which is D. Okay, so question number 10, still on temperature and um, heat or thermal energy. Which of the following describes evaporation? Okay, so this is a really good definition question. Evaporation is something that happens at any temperature. Okay, so it leaves us these two. But it's a phenomena which happens on the surface due to collisions with the particles in the surrounding gas. So it must be at the surface, okay? So it's A. At 11, we have which of the following is the temperature of an object related to? Well, you should remember that it's proportional to the kinetic energy of not the object, but the particles of the object, okay? So it's B, and that was just a simple basic definition question. Question 12, it brings us to simple harmonic motion. And you should remember from the definitions that the defining formula equals A, well, is minus, equals minus omega squared X because A is proportional oops, to x in the opposite direction okay so the displacement of the object again this is a definition that you should learn right again with simple okay so again with simple harmonic motion but this time we're looking at the interplay between elastic potential energy and kinetic energy so if we have a look at this situation um, point O is the center of the oscillation. So at O, um, we're going to look at elastic potential energy. It's a big explosion there. And um, kinetic energy. And we're going to look at X, O, and Y. Um, let's start with X. If you can imagine this spring, it's going to be squashed. Okay, so there's going to be a, like a large amount of um, elastic potential energy stored in it at x. So here we're going to have high, we should write max actually, a maximum. okay. And then as the spring comes away from that and goes through zero, 
okay, at the equilibrium position, the spring is unstretched. So here we have um, zero, okay. But then as it moves away to y, the spring is stretched, okay. And at y, we have its maximum possible situation, okay, maximum there because it's stretched out. So that's what's happening with the elastic potential energy. The kinetic energy, let's have a look. Starting at x, at that point where m reaches x, its velocity goes from being in this direction, okay, to flipping into the opposite direction. So at that point, it goes through zero. The velocity is actually zero. As the spring then moves towards O, its velocity is increasing, and in fact, at O, it has its maximum velocity. And then when it reaches Y, again, it gets to a point where the velocity gets to zero because it then starts to increase in the opposite direction as it moves back. So what we find, if we compare the energies, they do not coincide so the answer is D, neither O, X, nor Y. Question 14. It's a nice little definition question. Microwave ovens cause water molecules to resonate. Water molecules have natural frequency F. In order to heat food most effectively, the frequency should be well, if we think of resonance, resonance happens at F. So you really need that driving frequency to be equal to F. Okay, so the answer is B. Okay, question 15. Definition of um, longitudinal waves. If we have a look, we have particles equally spaced along a straight line and the sound wave passing through a gas. Um, here we see that there's compression, rarefaction, and then compression again. So this is like an entire cycle. It's very different to transverse waves where you have um, like the opposite happening. It's very tempting to sometimes think that this is a wavelength, but you can actually do that with a longitudinal wave because the, it does basically this is one cycle here, okay? So the distance of the, which is the wavelength will be from one particle to its exactly corresponding next particle who's in the same position and moving in the same direction, which would be this one. Okay, so the answer is B. Okay, right, question 16. A particle with positive charge plus Q moves freely from one plate held at potential V1 to one held at V2. Um, so which of the following is the electric potential energy lost by the charge? Well, we've always talked about um, the, ch the energy due to a charge as EV when we're considering an electron which is equal to QV if it's a positive charge. Okay, so this is the amount of energy in a moving charge. Now, what does V correspond to? The potential difference. So, if we have a look on here, the difference in potential would be V1 minus V2. Okay, the difference. So, therefore, the total energy is Q times the difference in potential which is D. Oops. Question 17. Which of the following graphs show the relationship between current and voltage for a filament lamp? Well, if you remember from a filament lamp, okay, this is a simple, the wire gets hot and as the wire gets hot, the resistance increases because the particles in the wire start to get in the way of the flow of the charge and it becomes harder for it. So you get an increase. And as the resistance increases, we can think of it as 
the best way to think about it is if you have um, a graph of V over I, okay, because resistance equals voltage over current. If the graph was V over I, you could see that the gradient is increasing, it's getting steeper. But what about these graphs that we're given? As you can see, the graphs that we're given have the axes the other way around. So you need to think about the slope doing the opposite. Instead of increasing, the slope is decreasing. Okay, so the answer is D. You can see it. But these are, you're basically going to have to learn off by heart the voltage current characteristics of all these components. Okay, so let's try this one. We have three identical lamps. Um, two of them in parallel and one in series. So what happens to the reading in the voltmeter if X breaks? Well, if we remember the relationship for resistors in parallel, the overall resistance of putting two in parallel decreases. So what does that mean? That having these two in parallel means that the resistance of each one, okay, um, the overall effect is less than having one, okay? So having two in parallel is gives less resistance than having one on its own. So if one of these breaks, okay, X breaks, you go back to the original situation where the resistance is higher. So if the resistance here is higher, we can imagine that the energy that is uh, given by the battery, the, the voltage, has to be greater across here because there is more resistance. And therefore, if there's more energy across these um, bulbs, there has to be less across this one, which means that the reading on the voltmeter will decrease. Okay, question 19. We're now moving on to field strength. We have Gravitational field strength at the surface of a planet, G. Um, so if you think G, the formula, the relationship, you can um, derive it from what's given on the data sheet because we know G is force per unit mass. And force equals um, G M1 M2 over R squared. So therefore, if you do F over M, Okay, which would be the equivalent of M2. You end up with G equals G, M, the mass of the object, over R squared. Okay, so which of the following is going to, what's going to happen to the gravitational field strength G if the radius is doubled and the mass is doubled? Well, if you double the radius, you can see here R is squared. So you're going to double the radius, and you're going to double the mass. So as a consequence, this squared would give us 4 down here and 2 up here. So as a consequence, it's cancelled. We'd end up with 1 over 2, and g would be halved. So the overall effect is that the gravitational field strength would halve, which is A. Okay, now we're on to question 20. This is a tricky question because you can't, you're not given enough information to calculate anything. You just have to use your common sense, which isn't easy in an exam condition sometimes. We have two point charges of size 2Q and Q. And we have to consider position 1, position 2, and position 3. Which of these will have an electric field strength due to zero? And remember, field strength is the force per unit charge, okay? And that force per unit charge is due to the charge itself, okay? So if we start with situation two, okay? Now, this one can't be zero, can't be zero, because uh, two is bigger than one, Okay, so there is going to be more of a field strength here due to this charge than this one. So there will be a resultant. So it's impossible that this is going to be zero. So we now just need to choose between one and three. If we compare these two, we can see that it can't be H 
here because this charge is so much bigger than this one. Well, it's twice as big as this one. So if it has to be anywhere, it must be three because this is the one that's going to have the least influence from it's furthest away from the greatest charge. Okay, so and it's closest to the smallest one. So it's more likely to be three only. Okay, 21. Um, I'm going to have to do a little bit later because um, I set you a different question. This is one of the last things that we need to cover. Um, so we're going to leave that for now. Uh, 22. We're going on to radioactivity. Which of the following would decrease the initial activity of a sample of plutonium? Now, this is to do with the spontaneous nature. If we think of spontaneous nature, it means that nothing will slow it down. Okay, so no external event. So decreasing the temperature will make no difference. Placing the sample in a lead container, no, that will do no difference. What it will do is absorb the emissions, but it won't stop the emissions from taking place. Placing the sample in a dark room, well, that would be great if you could reduce um, the activity of a radioactive substance by just switching the lights off, but unfortunately not. The only way that you can decrease the initial activity is by simply having less of the mass, having less atoms in the first place. Um, let's see. Okay. 23. This is a simple, straightforward question on half-life. We have a half-life of three days. Okay, so if we go from, if we go through one half-life, we start at 12, Becquerel's one half life will give us six BQ, and then six days is two half lives. So we go from six BQs once again to three. Why? Because we've had two entire half lives, and so therefore it goes down by half once, twice. The answer would be B. Question 24. Now, this is a bit of a tricky one. We have um, a nitrogen atom absorbing an alpha particle. Now, this is a very strange situation. If we think about the nat like natural decays that we've come across, decay is a natural process. So anything with the word decay has to happen naturally. And in terms of absorption, the only time you get absorption happy, happening is under the very extreme situation of um, hydrogen being absorbed to make helium, which is fusion. Okay, so this can't be the answer either because nuclear fusion is hydrogen making helium inside the core of the sun. Um, proton decay can't be the answer because decay is a natural process and this kind of absorption would not happen naturally. It can't be A because alpha decay would be, the alpha particle would be in this side of the equation. Remember, this is where the daughter nuclei, the products of a nuclear reaction, appear. Okay, so this is absorption. So the answer is artificial transmutation. And what is that? When you artificially um, create a radioactive substance by making it absorb a particle, in this case an alpha particle. So that was a tricky one. Question 25, we have an energy flow diagram and it's asking us about efficiency. So if you think back to our formula for efficiency, you have energy out, useful energy out, over the energy in. So if we think of a car, we put fuel in. We don't want thermal energy, that's useless. We want kinetic energy. So we're talking about 30 over 100, which would give us 0 0.3, but then times 100 would give us 30%. So the answer is A. Okay, so again, we're looking at power, but this time we're looking at power out over power in. And by this we mean 
useful. Power out. So we have biofuel, burning ethanol with a 25% um, efficiency. So that would be 25%, or we could just write 25 over 100. Okay, instead of having the 100 here. The energy density is 30 megajoules per kilogram. Okay, so this is um, our power in. We're using fuel, which is 30 megajoules per kilogram. And how many kilograms do we have? We have 50. Okay, so our PO, which is what we're trying to find out, the power out, over the power in, which is 30 megajoules times 50. Okay. So if I rewrite that here to give myself a bit more space, we have P naught equals 25 times 30 times 50 over 100, which if we have a look, 30, 50, 25 is A. Okay. 27. An oscillating water column, ocean wave energy converter produces power P. Which of the following would be the power produced from waves of twice the amplitude and twice the wave speed? So if we have a look at our, our equations from the data sheet, luckily we don't have to learn them all off by heart. We have power per unit length, which we'll do for now. Um, power equals half A squared density GV. Okay, so find a little color. We're going to now use this as our P, but now we're going to have twice the amplitude. So if I put it down here, 2A squared, okay, and twice the wave speed, so it's going to be 2v. So if we have a look, 2 squared equals 4a, the amplitude has now gone up by 4, blink, and 2v, so we've got 4 times 2, power is now 8 times greater, so the answer is c. The trick with these is just remembering, not to learn the formulas, but just to recognise them from the data sheet because it doesn't actually say where they all are. So it's definitely worth revising. Question 28. The total power of the sun is P. The distance from the sun is D. The albedo is alpha. Now, if you remember, albedo is the measure of the radiated power over the total power received. So it gives you a measure of how much is reflected. What isn't reflected is absorbed. So the way to express how much is absorbed using this albedo figure is basically all the rest. It would be 1 minus that number. This is a really tricky question. Okay, so we're not using albedo directly. We're using like the inverse of it which would be 1 minus, well not the inverse, but the rest. Now, let's have a look at the rest of this question. The power absorbed by each square meter of the Earth's surface. Okay, so if we think of the sun as a disk, okay, and it sends out its energy in a sphere, um, what is the energy per square meter. Well, it would be the power of the sun divided by the surface area of that sphere at a distance d from the sun. Okay, so you always have to imagine this as a sphere spreading out. And the area or the um, surface area of a sphere would be 4 pi d squared. Oops, press that button. Okay, so that would give us the power per square meter of that sphere surface. And then multiply it by the ratio of energy absorbed, not reflected. So one minus that. So the answer is D.
This is a tricky one, but I think once you've done it once, you won't be tricked again. Okay, so question 29. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas because it absorbs infrared light. Now, that seems right, but... Um, let's have a look at the other questions, because there is a little bit more to it. B, it absorbs ultraviolet light. Well, ultraviolet is completely irrelevant to the explanation, so we can cross both of those off. And then C, because its natural frequency of molecular oscillation lies in the infrared region. That sounds pretty perfect to me. In fact, that is the reason why carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So the answer is C. And then question 30, which is the most likely to increase the rate of global warming? Or we'll have a look, deforestation is definitely likely to increase global warming. And let's have a quick look at the others just in case. Increasing the use of nuclear weapons, or nuclear weapons, sorry, nuclear power stations. That can't increase it, if anything, it might decrease them. C, increasing the use of renewable energy sources. Well, that's not going to increase, that's going to decrease. And using natural gas, well, that's not necessarily going to make much difference. If anything, it might decrease it slightly. But anyway, the answer is obviously A. Okay, so that is, um, those are the answers to the standard level multiple choice.